So we're gonna talk about this thing, but um, before we do, I wanna put it into context because I'm kinda of gonna tear into it and I wanna tell you guys why. It matters, it really does matter. There are three of us uh, here on YouTube who kind of focus on 3D printing content that all call ourselves industrial designers. There might be more, but they're sort of, <laughs> the other two guys are much bigger channels than mine, but uh, I don't think they ever worked professionally as industrial designers. I think they just did the schooling for it. And I didn't do the schooling for it. In fact, I have an architecture degree, but I worked professionally as an industrial designer. And um, you know, I've had some pretty good paying gigs in that space. But what does it mean to be an industrial des designer? Like there's a lot of, uh, jobs that kind of fall under that umbrella term. And one of those jobs is being a sketcher. Literally, you're just a sketch artist. You draw with Copic markers all day um, shapes and forms that you think are appealing. It's an artistic endeavor. And that's, it's, you have to have an understanding for the thing that's going to be made, but I would say it's, it's real close to art and a long way from engineering. There's a problem when you give somebody control of a project who is an artist, because artists have a focus on form. And you've heard the term form follows function and it's just a tragedy whenever that happens. It's, it's always bad. Now, form is incredibly important, but there's a dance. There's a feedback loop. You do form into function, back into form, back into function, and eventually you whittle it down into a very functional and also very elegant product. So this thing here, this thing, is clearly the result of a sketch artist thinking that he knows what to do. <laughs> and then uh, they handed it off to somebody else who is equally inept uh, to make it, and they made some stupid decisions. <laughs> All the while, the, um, I'm gonna call him the electronics engineer, the PCB engineer, so that guy, uh, he did an okay job, but he was clearly price constrained, so he was trying to make it as cheap as possible. And the other two guys, they weren't helping. So let's, let's break into this, make fun of it, and you know, as crappy as it is, uh, it's still functional. So I'm gonna put it on a printer. Let's get it working. Okay, so a primitive is a basic shape like a cube or a sphere, and industrial design schools across the globe churn out tens of thousands, or maybe just, you know, thousands of, of industrial designer sketch artists every year. So yeah, over the years, we've got tens of thousands of these guys floating around the world who all have the exact same aesthetics in mind. And it's basically using primitives and sort of marrying them to each other and then oh violating your expectations so for instance let's say you have a sort of squarish box right like so well what do you do to that what do you do to what do you soften it okay let's soften it by putting a massive fillet yeah let's put a massive fillet on it so that's what they would do they put a massive sort of bent bent edge there oh you know what let's do it to the let's do it to kitty corner too just to violate expectations because people would think that it would be this corner so yeah, in the end you have a shape that looks like that, something like that, right? Oh, that's real nice looking. Okay, this is really basic. This is like your first sort of initial inkling. You you'd, would work on that for a while and the more you work on it, the more sort of complex and yet still clean looking it becomes. Another favorite technique of industrial design sketch artists is to take like a real clean sort of cylinder shape, right? And then instead of terminating the cylinder like the, like the bottom is, you know, instead of having this, this typically sort of round thing, what they would do is they'd put a slice on it, diagonal slice. So it's gonna look something like that when it's in. Ooh, hey, look, it's an Alexa. Is that an Alexa? Basically, oh, you know what else we can do? We can, let's put a, let's put a changing, let's make it look like a vase with this cut. Ooh, I love it. Oh yeah, I'll make that out of plastic. And up here we'll put some fancy glow buttons that look like a, look like a, touch screen on your phone. Oh yeah, this is so sexy. <laughs> this is the thinking, you know? And there's no there's no consideration or reverence for what's going inside of there, right? There's no holistic picture. This is just some artist's concept of, of the shape that you want sitting on your table or on your shelf or whatever it is. They don't care what goes in there. They're agnostic to the function of it. It's just a, supposed to be an art piece that sits there. So look at this thing. 
doesn't it just embody every, all the thinking that I was just talking about? It's just a cylinder, or not even a cylinder. It's it's a rectangular you know box that's been you know truncated at each end with you know a semicircle, and then they put a I don't know why they put a, a chamfer on there. Generally speaking, mixing chamfers and fillets is a, is a ton of bad form. So that points to the fact that this might not have actually been designed by a professional. So we got an amateur who thinks that they're an industrial designer making this. And as far as the blue lettering goes, doesn't that look like it's just a fake screen? Like it's just trying so hard to be a backlit screen. Here, let's, uh, let's take this label right here and, uh, and actually put a backlight to it. Ooh, that's what they want. That's what they want. <laughs> and all of this, all of this stupidness, when this is the only thing that matters. This is the PCB. This is the core of the functionality. You do need one other part, and that is the um, encoder wheel. You see that wheel in there? You see how it's got those holes drilled in it? So those holes allow the light. This is the light, and that's the light reader. And so they allow, they allow the light to pass through or be blocked. And by that rotating through, it registers movement. This is the way that old mice used to work, rotary encoders. It's a pretty old technique. All of this wasted enormity for this functionality. And it's so heavy. This has got to be 20 times heavier than it needs to be. This is just so ridiculously overbuilt. Okay, why, why do we have three wheels? That's my biggest question here, functionally speaking. There's two wheels here that, um, okay, so this pinches like so, right? There's a spring that goes right here. Here's our, here's our spring that goes in the gap. And this pinches across the filament, which gets fed in there, you see that? And so those two uh, bearing wheels get driven by the filament sliding through it. And this one here, this wheel here, engages this rubber wheel. And the rubber wheel, I hope you guys can see that, has little tiny holes drilled in it and there's eight of the holes. But why do we have this wheel to drive the rubber wheel? Why don't we drive the rubber wheel directly from the filament and save a bunch of money in, you know, you get rid of a whole wheel that the customer doesn't have to purchase. So here we see very, very thick walls on this plastic injection molded part. And that means that they had to hold the pressure on the part as it cooled. They had to maintain that pressure, which means that your cycle times in the machine were a lot higher than they need to be. And the higher the cycle times, the more money you have to spend. Not only that, if I take this knife here and scratch it, like cut a little bit of this, um, this um, casting, this injection molded part, if I cut this, we can hear it scratching. What that means is this is glass fiber reinforced nylon. Such an expensive plastic, and why? This thing is dangling on a Bowden tube. Why on earth do we need something so massively overbuilt with a massively expensive, you know, plastic? You could drive a tank over this thing. Why? Oh, it's just so stupid. Okay, enough bagging on the design. Let's talk about the engineering of the thing. Like I said, the encoder wheel has eight holes drilled in it, and what matters is the change state of reading between a hole to being blocked. So the light here being blocked versus you know not blocked. So the change state is what matters. That means there's 16 change states on this wheel. So the resolution is 16 divisions of this wheel. Well, I took a piece of filament and slid it down the, the bearing here, and this got me a full revolution of that wheel, which means I have 50 millimeters here uh, for a full revolution. Well, 50 divided by 16 is 3.125 millimeters. So every 3.125 millimeters uh, is when this thing knows that it's still feeding filament. And in between that, so if you only extrude two millimeters, it has no idea. There's no change. So it needs 3.125 millimeters to know whether or not filament is moving or not. That's a pretty re low resolution, but it gets worse. Okay. So this is a 1.75 millimeter piece of filament and the orifice on the nozzle that it's being squeezed out of is 0.4 millimeters. Well, if you do all the math, that equates to um, just this thickness of filament here, if you squeeze this through, gets reduced to 60. So uh, 3.125 millimeters here equals 60 millimeters of equivalent filament. 
you know, just dribbling straight out of the nozzle. But then you're gonna squish that down for the layer height of, you know, half the nozzle width, so 0.2 millimeters, which means 120 millimeters of travel. So this nozzle physically has to move on the print 120 millimeters before this knows that it's out of filament. Well, that's how much printing has to happen before the sensor tells the printer that <laughs> that the filament is jammed or run out or something like that. Imagine you're printing a pretty narrow piece of geometry. You could be three layers up. You could have printed three layers before it knows that it ran out of filament. And if you're three layers up, good luck trying to restart that print and getting any layer adhesion. But thanks to the Duet ecosystem being just so user friendly, it's a really easy install, so let's make it happen. Well, here it is guys, dangling off the side of my printer like a security anti-theft tag. And uh, I've got it plugged in up here to the um, extruder number two. So that would be pin four or E1 if you're talking software, but that's the extruder pin plug. And it's supposed to be a really easy um, command, M591 I think it is, in, in um, RepRap firmware to get this set up. So I had this plugged in, just like it's supposed to be, into the sensor and I just can't get it to work. And checking the voltage, it should be receiving three volts, so not even the full 3.3 volts that it's rated to handle. Unfortunately, the PCB in this thing has no status indicator LED, so you don't know if it's on or not. And I just wanted to see if that light is maybe not an infrared light, maybe I can see that light to know whether or not it's receiving power. And so I plugged this in, the way that it's supposed to be plugged in, see that that plug can only go one way, and these are the XXX is positive, the um, long dashes signal, and the black line is ground. So I've got those plugged in correctly up here on the switch. Um, I mean, if it's if, if these aren't labeled like that, then it's something's wrong with their with their wiring. They they use the incorrect wiring. So I plug this in on my second sensor board here, and I don't think. It's gonna do it anymore, I think it's done doing it, but basically this little chip up here in the corner started smoking. Let the magic smoke out. So 3.3 volts plugged in correctly and it started smoking. Everything about this sensor is a disaster, everything. This is a complete and total waste of money. So yeah, getting this sensor to work in firmware is supposed to be extremely straightforward. It's a single line in the firmware configuration file and so you basically Put it on the uh, the Bowden tube, plug it into the board, put that line in your firmware configuration, and you're done, and it works, right? It could have been a two minute video, which is why I decided to sort of focus on the product design of the thing, uh, because it was just gonna be too short of a video. And then I spent the last you know hour or two troubleshooting it, trying every different configuration uh, that I can think of, because it just wasn't working. And I was like, huh? So that's when I tried the other a PCB from the other sensor. And once I saw the magic smoke coming off that microchip, I mean, that's literally the smoking gun. So every single thing about this sensor is crappy from top to bottom. It's a fail at every single level. And look at the name, proudly displayed on the box, big as you can get it, Big Tree Tech. So I constantly get comments from guys who want me to uh, review the Big Tree Tech SKR 1.4 board, which now can handle having um, RepRap firmware ported onto it. But Big Tree Tech, if this is the kind of level of, of product that they make, I don't want to waste a week of my life trying to learn about that control board. I have never been not let down by Chinese electronics. Every single time. And this one is a special kind of crappy. Like it is at another level. I cannot believe how bad this is. So uh, yeah, I'm never gonna touch an SKR board. I'm not gonna waste my time. It's worth it, you guys. 3D printing, getting your 3D printer set up can be so incredibly frustrating. Days of your life chasing down a gremlin. You have to go with the, with the company that's just gotten everything right. The company that invented a lot of the tech to begin with, and that is Duet. So I will never touch uh, another Big Tree Tech electronics package. It's just, it's not worth my time. I'm really upset that I wasted the time to make this video. And you know what's worse? <laughs> uh, 
negative videos like this, they just get downvoted and they disappear. Plus you've got the uh, the Chinese, you know, uh, their sock puppets that, you, that upvote and downvote and leave comments and everything like that. I call them Wu Mao a lot of the times. But uh, so the big tree tech guys probably have their little comment farm out there and they don't want this information to get out there. So they're gonna be downvoting. So this video is probably gonna get like a thousand views if I'm lucky. Oh, what a waste of time. So yeah, stay away, stay far, far away from this sensor. Thanks for watching. See you next time.